Hi, this is Jay McClellan, and in this two-part video series, I'm going to show you how I cut some shell inlay for the headstock of some guitars I'm making. Now, in this video, part one, I'm going to show you how I go from a photograph to a design in Fusion 360, and from there how I generate tool paths, and finally G-code in order to drive my CNC machine to cut out the shell inlay material and the pocket in the headstock into which it fits. If you've never used Fusion 360 before, that's perfectly fine. I'll show you how to get started and uh, walk you through every step of the process. And we'll create an inlay design and create some tool paths and generate some G-code to drive a CNC machine. And then in the second video, part two, I'm going to take that G-code and set it up on my machine and cut out the parts and actually make the inlay for these guitars. Now, it's been a while. Uh, since I've been doing projects like this and posting videos on YouTube, I've just been busy with other stuff and uh, it's nice to be finally getting back into the shop and making videos again, so I hope you enjoy this. Starting from a blank project in Fusion 360, first thing I'll do is click on Create and New Component. And I'll create a new component and give it a name, Inlay, and that'll just serve as a container for the items I'm about to create next. Now I'm going to insert a canvas, so I'll click on Insert canvas and insert from my computer and I'm going to browse to a picture that I have that I'm going to use as a reference for creating my design. I'll press open and I'm going to select the red green which is the XY plane for my canvas and for now I'm going to just make sure the canvas opacity is set to about 50 percent and press OK to insert it. Next I'll click on the, uh, the top of this little navigation cube in the upper right Clicking on the top view will just orient my canvas to face me and then I can move over and roll the mouse wheel in to zoom in so that I can see my pattern that I'm going to use. And I'll click the center mouse button and hold it while I drag to shift the pattern around a little bit just so I can see what I'm doing. Next I'll go over to the browser on the left hand side and expand my inlay component and expand the canvases group and you can see this dragonfly, which was the name of the file, the image file that I used, is the canvas that I inserted. And if I right click on that and select Calibrate, now I can pick two points on the image for which I can specify a real world size and it will scale the image accordingly. So I'm going to click on the left wing and on the right wing tip. And I know that when I create my finished inlay, I want my pattern to be about 33 millimeters wide. So I'll enter 33 here to rescale the image. As you can see, it made it a lot bigger, and so I'm just going to roll the center mouse wheel back to zoom back out, and then click the center mouse button and reposition as I did before. This is a picture of a dragonfly that, sitting on a screen door that I took many, many years ago. And you can see it's not a great picture. It's got some things wrong with it. Uh, for one thing, the dragonfly is a bit crooked and it has some damage on the wings. And that's all perfectly fine. You could use just about any photo because we're just going to use this as a, as a guideline for drawing our pattern. This could also be a hand-drawn sketch of a pattern that you have in mind. Just about anything. And it, it does not have to be perfect or even close to perfect. Just enough to give you a guideline for creating a drawing. Next, I want to orient my image relative to the origin and axes of my model. So I'll go over to the browser on the left and you can see that inside my component there's an item called origin. There's also one for the model as a whole, but the one inside my component is going to show up better. So I'm going to click this eyeball to the left of it to turn it back on because Fusion 360 uh, hit it for me. So now I can see the origin of my component and I want to align that with the drawing or align the drawing with the origin. I'll right click again on my Dragonfly canvas and select Edit Canvas. And now I have these handles that I can use to rotate and shift the image. So first I'm going to get it aligned with the axis of my uh, origin. And I rotate it a little bit to the left to try to get it straight up and down. And I'll grab this square and kind of slide it around. And I may need to click the center mouse button to reposition, click and drag and then roll the mouse in or out if I need to zoom. And once I get it so I can see what I'm doing, I can grab this square again. And I'm going to move the canvas so that the front nose, if you will, of the dragonfly is right on the origin. 
and you can see that the angle lines up pretty well with the vertical axis. In this case, it's going to be the y-axis of my model. If not, I could adjust the angle a little more, but this looks about right. So I'll move it down, get it adjusted to the origin of my model, and I'll go over here and press OK. Now that I have my canvas scaled and aligned correctly with my model, I can start creating a sketch of the pattern that I want to create. So I'll go up here and select Create, and then Create Sketch. And when I create a sketch, I have to specify the plane on which I want to sketch, and I want this XY plane. So I'm just going to move over and select this yellow square that represents the XY plane to place my sketch parallel to the plane of the canvas that I inserted. And now I can draw my pattern. I'll click and drag with the center mouse button again to recenter things the way I want. Maybe zoom out just a little so I can see the entire pattern and get things situated. You can see that the vertical green axis fits pretty well through the body of my dragonfly. Doesn't fit very well at the tail because I think he was just kind of holding his tail off to the left. That's fine. It's not going to hurt anything. I just wanted to get it approximately aligned because the picture is really just a rough guide to what we're going to draw. You can create your pattern with all kinds of elements, lines and arcs and circles and squares, whatever you like. I'm going to create mine using splines because this is a curvy pattern. So I'll go over here and click Create Spline and select Fit Point Spline. This is going to fit a curve through any number of points that I specify. And I'm going to start by drawing out the left side of the dragonfly's body. So I'll click on the origin point and then eh, just place a few points around the edge. It doesn't have to be exact at this stage. Just get them kind of close. Don't worry too much about the curve, whether it looks exactly right. Just scatter some points around to get the approximate idea. About like that. That looks pretty good. And I'll, uh, I'll click that check check mark to complete. Now you can see it shows all the control points in my spline. And uh, as I was going, I tried to put some points close to where the wings are going to join. That makes it a little easier to draw the, the wings, uh, the splines for the wings. I'm going to press Escape and to get out of Insert a Spline mode and tweak this a little bit. I want to move this control point a little bit, so I just click and drag it. And I want to arrange it so that I have some control points right at the points where the wings are going to intersect there and there. And I'll drag this one down just a little bit. That looks pretty good. I can tweak this more later. I just want to get it about right. And now I'll add the wings. And I have a shortcut up here to the fit point spline uh, operation. So I'll just click on that. And then I'll add another spline. I'm going to do the lower wing first. Because in a dragonfly, the, the rearward wing tends to sit on top of the forward wing. So I'll just sketch this out. Again, doesn't have to be exact. Just get it close. It's easier to put the points in and adjust later than try to get them exactly right at the get-go. So that's not too bad. We'll adjust it in a minute. And then I'm going to add another one. I'm still in insert a spline mode, so I'll add another one for this wing. and I joined it in there. I'm going to tweak those a little bit, uh, but I joined it to the existing spline point on the first spline. So that's not too bad. I'm going to press Escape to get out of Insert Spline Mode, and now we can adjust the curves to look a little bit better. The easiest way to tell you how to adjust cubic spline curves like this is just play with it. Uh, you can find tutorials on how to do it, and uh, honestly, I think the easiest way is to say just grab the points and move them around until things look the way you want. You'll get the hang of it pretty quickly, I think. So I'm going to drag these around. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the issues in designing a pattern like this for inlay. There are a couple things you want to think about and some things to avoid. One is you want to avoid really, really sharp points like this. If I have this sharp point here, I can cut it, but when I cut the pocket for this inlay, it's going to be cut into a piece of wood. And as the router bit tries to round this really sharp, fine point right here, there's a good chance that the wood is going to splinter off and break. It's a very weak, thin spot. 
and that kind of design is going to be difficult to machine cleanly. So I want to make this angle a little bit more extreme, uh, or less extreme. About like that is pretty good. I might even move this down a little more. Let's say about like that. I'm going to move this control point up a little bit. Oh, that, that was pretty weird. If you do something that, uh, <laughs> that makes a weird shape, just press Control z to undo. I wish life had an undo button sometimes. There we go. So that, that made that point just a little bit thicker, and that's going to machine better. Next, I want to create a mirror image of these three curves to make the other half of my dragonfly. And I need a reference line to mirror those about. So I'm going to press L to insert a line. Click on my top point and click on my bottom point. And then I'll press Escape to get out of Insert Align mode. And I'm going to click on the line and press X, which turns it into a dashed construction line. I don't want this line to be part of my contour. I don't want to split my contour down the middle. I just need it as a reference. And so now that I have a reference line, I can create a mirror image. I'll select the Create and Mirror option. Or I can just click the mirror button up here if you have uh, the shortcut button at the top. And it will come up with uh, objects selected to be mirrored. And right now I had selected that vertical line. That's not what I want. So I'm going to click the X to remove that. And I'll click on my three curves. One, two, three. Those are the things I want to create a mirror of. And then I go over here and click on mirror line. And click the center reference line that I just created. And I'll press OK, and now I have a mirror image. You can see it's kind of busy. And one of the reasons it's busy is each of these points that I created now has a constraint that it is a mirror image of the corresponding point on the other side of the reference line. That's fine, but it makes it really cluttered. So if you go over to this Sketch Palette panel, you can turn off the Show Constraints checkbox, and that just hides those and makes it quite a bit less busy. This palette can also be minimized to get it out of your way. And now if I just click on the background to deselect all of those curves, my pattern is a lot less busy. Now we can see another problem in this shape in terms of being able to machine it, and that's down here at the bottom. I have a really sharp inside corner right here, at least from the perspective of cutting the wood inlay. My router bit would have to come down into this corner and try to cut a sharp point. And a, a router bit cuts a round profile, so it can't do that. You really have to avoid or, or deal with sharp inside corners like that. I would have the same issue if I tried to cut this entire dragonfly shape out of a single piece of inlay material, because when I was cutting that, if the router bit were cutting around the outside, I have another sharp inside corner here, one here, one here. All of these inside corners cannot be cut perfectly by a round router bit. One thing you can do is just cut it the best you can and then go back and clean it up by hand. And there's nothing wrong with that. Inlay has been cut by hand for many hundreds of years, and you can certainly cut it with a CNC router and then go in and clean it up with a knife or a chisel or whatever you need to do. When cutting the pocket in the wood background into which the inlay will fit, these corners are not a problem. The router bit runs inside the pocket and it can go around sharp corners just fine. But this corner at the bottom then is an inside corner for the pocket and that won't cut correctly. So the other thing I can do that I will do here to fix that is to change the curve, change my design. And if I click on this curve to set it, it'll show me the control points of my spline. I'm going to zoom in on that. So let me roll the mouse out and then roll it back in so you can see this at the bottom. If I grab these handles of the control point and drag this line to a horizontal position, now I don't have that sharp corner. I have a nice uh, horizontal tangent at the bottom. And I can drag the line in a little bit to make it bigger or smaller until I like the shape. But if that's horizontal, we'll have a nice smooth curve at the bottom, and that's no problem to cut with a router bit. So I'll zoom back out and take a look at my overall design. You can see I have a similar issue at the top here. This really wouldn't be a big problem, a uh, little bit of a problem to cut that shape of the inlay material because that would be a slight inside corner, but it's probably close enough that it wouldn't hurt anything.
but I don't really want this to be indented at the top. I want a nice round head for my dragonfly here. So I'm going to adjust this top line to be horizontal or close enough. It doesn't have to be perfect, just pretty close to horizontal. That'll give me a nice smooth curve at the top. Okay, now let's zoom out and take a look at the overall shape. And at this point, I'm going to get this image out of my way. I just want to look at my pattern. So I'm going to zoom till things fit in my screen pretty well. And I'll go over here to the browser panel on the left and click the eyeball icon next to the dragonfly canvas to hide it. And if I click on the background to deselect, now we can see this is my pattern all by itself. At this point, when you're drawing your own pattern, you can tweak it any way you like. I'm done using the image and I'm just going to look at this as a standalone design now and I'm just going to kind of tweak it until it looks the way I want it to look. So I'm going to change the shape of this lower wing a little bit and maybe make some of these corners a little less tight both for appearance and for manufacturability. That's not too bad. I could keep playing with it. Maybe make this, if you have a, a, a point on the curve that is, let's say, too pointy and you want to make it a little more rounded, you can click on the curve, click on that control point, and then just expand these handles. There we go. You can see you can make it <laughs> pretty weird, but if you just drag them out just a little bit, that'll make it a little more rounded. I'm reasonably happy with that design, so I think we'll stop there. There's one more step I need to do before I finish this sketch. I'm going to press R to insert a rectangle, and I'm going to click above the upper left of my design, above the upper left corner, and then drag a rectangle around my whole design. It doesn't matter really how big it is, just somewhat bigger, leave a little bit of space around the design. We're going to need that border in order to create a background for machining purposes. So at this point, we can finish the sketch. So I'll click on Finish Sketch. Now's a good time to save the project. So I'll press Control S, and I'll give this a name. We'll call it uh, Dragonfly. In the next step, I'm going to take these contours that I created and extrude them into some three-dimensional shapes. And to do that, I'm going to first hold down the Shift key and click the center mouse button and drag it to rotate this into an orientation that shows me a little more of the three-dimensional shape I'm going to create. So I'll press E for extrude, and I'm going to click on the upper left wing, and I'm going to enter a distance here, minus 1.5 millimeters. That's the thickness of the inlay material that I'm using. So whatever thickness of material you're using, just enter that, and make sure to enter negative so you extrude downward, because I want the zero, the origin of my model, to be at the top surface of my inlay. Next I'll press OK. Now Fusion 360 also hid the sketch I was using, and I'm not done with it. So I need to go over here to the left in the browser, expand the sketches container, and turn on the eyeball next to my sketch so I can see it again. And now I'm going to extrude shapes for the other components of my design. I'll press E to extrude again, and let's extrude the lower left wing. And I'll enter minus 1.5. And if you look in the extrude dialog box, because it detected that this touches an existing body, the operation has changed to join, which means it's going to create a single piece out of these two things. That's not what I want. So I'm going to change that to new body and press OK. Now I'll repeat that process for the other elements. And one more time, I'm going to extrude this background shape. So I'll click on the background, minus 1.5, but there's a difference this time. I don't just want to create a new body. I want to put the background in its own component and press OK. If I expand the bodies container in the browser on the left, you can see it created these elements and just named them body 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm going to give them more descriptive names. So if I click on them once and then click again, I'll call this upper left wing. The background item is not in this container because I put it in its own component. So it's down here. So if I click that, if I turn off the visibility of my sketch, you can see that it's really hard to see the individual pieces. And so I'm going to give them a different appearance. I'll go up here to the Modify panel. I can click down and select Appearance. 
I can click this icon or simply press A to open the appearance panel. And in this panel, I can give items appearance of various kinds of materials. I'm just going to use glossy paint. You can use anything you like. Uh, so we'll click and drag these and you can see you can change individual pieces. You can also uh, pick colors that represent your finished design if you want to get an idea of what it's going to look like. That's perfectly fine. You can indulge yourself with whatever colors you like. I'm just going to drag some arbitrary colors into these elements so I can tell them apart. And uh, then I'll close the appearance panel. Now that my inlay design is done, I'm going to switch from the design workspace to the manufacturer workspace using the drop down in the upper left. And the first thing I will do in the manufacturer workspace is create a setup. So I'll click setup and new setup. And most of the defaults are okay in here, but I do want to change a couple of things. The orientation is fine because I set up my model in the XY plane, which corresponds to how my CNC machine is set up. The origin, however, has defaulted to the middle of this box that it created around my pattern, and that's not what I want. I want to change this to model origin because I positioned my pattern so that the model origin was right at the top of the dragonfly, and I'm going to use that as visual reference when I'm doing my machining. The other thing I want to do is go in here and select the model that I'm going to use. I'm going to open up models and just select my dragonfly top level component as the model to use. Next I'll switch to the stock tab. And the defaults are pretty good, but I do want to change a couple of them. I want to change my stock top offset to zero because I'm going to start machining right at the top surface of my inlay pattern. And the other thing I'll do is change the stock bottom offset to let's say five millimeters because I'm not going to cut all the way through the wood material of my background. That's good enough for defining my setup, so I'll press OK. Before I create tool paths to start cutting these out, I'm going to go up here to Manage and select the Tool Library. I'll select this icon at the top for New Mill Tool. And I'll switch to the General tab and give my cutter a name. I'm going to call it Shell Cutter 132nd Inch. Mostly I'm working in metric units, but the cutter that I have is specified in inches, so that's how I'm going to name it. I'll switch to the Cutter tab, and I need to change the type of the cutter from ball end mill to flat end mill, and then I need to specify its diameter. The diameter of this tool is 0.0313 space IN. That tells the system I'm, I'm specifying this in inches, not millimeters, which is the default. Next, I'll switch to the Holder tab, and you can see that when it draws this tool, which it will do if I try to simulate my tool path, it draws this gigantic holder, and I just want to get rid of that thing, so I'm going to click the X button next to the holder. Next, I'll switch to the Feed and Speed tab, and these settings specify the nominal speed of this cutter, and the first thing I'll do is change my spindle speed to 24,000 RPM, which is the speed that I run this cutter at. Next, I'm going to change my cutting feed rate. I have experimentally determined that 250 millimeters per minute is a good speed for this cutter. It's not super fast. I could maybe push it a little faster, but I don't want to take a chance on breaking it, and it's plenty fast enough for my purposes. The other thing I'll change is the ramp feed rate, and it looks like it says 333 here, but it's actually scrolled kind of strangely. I'm going to change that to 125 millimeters per minute. I'll press Tab to move to the plunge feed rate and change that also to 125 millimeters per minute. Those are then half as fast as the cutting feed rate. That just slows the machine down a little bit when it's ramping into the material or plunging down into the material. That's all I need to do to, to find my tool, so I'll press OK. And I need to define a second tool for cutting the pocket in the wood background. It's very similar, but I'm going to define a second tool for it. And because it's so similar, I'll right-click on the one I just created and press Duplicate Tool. Then I can right-click on the duplicate, press Edit Tool, and modify it as I want to. I'll switch to the General tab. I'll call this one Woodcutter. The one I'm going to use happens to be the same diameter, so I'll leave that alone. And everything else is pretty much the same. On the Woodcutter, I can actually increase the ramp and plunge feed rate slightly, so I'm going to go ahead and change those to 200. It doesn't make a big difference, actually. 
but uh, because the wood is not as brittle a material, I'm able to ramp and plunge a little bit faster. That speeds things up slightly. Now I'll press OK, and I have the two tools that I'm going to use in this project. And now I can press Escape to close this dialog. To create a tool path to cut out the shell inlay material, I'm going to use a 2D contour tool path. So I'll click on the 2D section and select 2D contour. And this opens the dialog for this tool path. The first thing I'll do is select the tool I'm going to use. And I'm going to pick the shell cutter that I, tool that I just defined. Press OK. And that filled in the spindle speed and all of the feed rates that I set up for that tool automatically. So this tab is done. Now I can switch to the geometry tab and I need to select the contour that I'm going to use for this tool path. So I'm going to click on the top contour of the upper left wing of the dragonfly. And you can see this red arrow is outside the contour. That specifies that I want to machine outside the contour. If I click on the red arrow to go inside, then it would cut a pocket that shape. That's not what I want to do. So we'll make sure the red arrow is outside and that defines where my tool path is going to do its machining. Next I'll switch to the Heights tab. And this defines various heights for different types of moves of the CNC router. And I'm going to change these heights a little bit. Uh, starting at the top, the, the clearance height is basically how high should it move to be certain that it's going to clear any obstructions. And I'm just going to change that to one millimeter. I don't need to go up as high. By reducing that, it just makes the toolpath run faster. Same with the retract height. I'm going to change that to one millimeter. And I'm going to change that instead of stock top to be relative to the feed height. Below that is the feed height. And the feed height, again, I'm going to set to be one millimeter relative to the top height. Uh, feed is where it starts feeding into the material as it's beginning a cut. The top height, stock top actually would work, but I'm going to change this to model top because I'm going to start cutting at the top of top surface of my model. The stock top is actually the same in this project, but I want to make sure that that's relative to the model. However, I don't want it to be zero. Yes, I really want to start cutting at the top of the material, but I'm going to increase this a little bit. Change it to 0 0.5. What that means is it's going to start the cutting operations half a millimeter above the material it's going to be cut. What I want it to do is go ahead and make one or possibly two cutting passes, just cutting air above the material so that I can watch where it is and make sure that it's actually cutting in the area I think it's cutting. If not, I have time to press the stop button and make adjustments. So this is a good technique to use, is to set your top height a bit higher than the material, cut a little bit of air. Yes, it slows things down, but that really gives you a chance to uh, make really, really sure that you want to cut where it's about to cut. For the bottom height, this specifies how far down the toolpath is going to cut. And I do want it relative to the contours that I selected. And I'm going to specify how far down I want to go. Because I'm specifying an offset going down, I need to enter a negative number here. If I enter negative 1.5, that would be the depth of my inlay material. So the cutter would cut right down to the bottom of the inlay and stop. That might be okay in a perfect world, but realistically, I'm not going to be able to get that height exactly perfectly right. So I want to cut a little bit deeper than that. I'm going to change this to minus 2 millimeters. So from the top of the inlay, I want the cutter bit to cut down two millimeters, which should cut about half a millimeter into the substrate that is holding the inlay material. That's perfectly fine. You'll see that in the next video when I do the machining, but that makes sure that I get cut all the way through. Next, I'll switch to the passes tab. Most of the defaults are okay on this thing, on this tab, but one thing I do want to change is multiple depths. I'm gonna scroll my mouse wheel down to scroll this. Uh, this is very important because I can't cut the entire depth of the material all at once with this cutter. It would break. It absolutely would break. So I want to make a series of shallow cuts around the perimeter of the shell material. And to do that, I'm going to change this maximum roughing step down. I'll change that to 0 0.3 millimeters. So I'm only going to cut off 0.3 millimeters each time I go around. That's quite conservative. 
I probably could cut more than that, but uh, if you make it too big, the tool's going to break. I'm not in a hurry, so I'm going to make a nice conservative cut and allow it to go around several times to cut the material. All of the other settings can be left at their default for this toolpath, so I'll press OK to generate the toolpath. You can see that it's showing me graphically the toolpath that it's going to cut, but I can't see most of it because it's hidden by this background box. So I'm going to expand my model over here, expand my inlay component, and go down to the background component and click the eyeball icon to turn that off. And now I can see that my toolpath is taking multiple passes around the perimeter of this shell material. Next, I need to do the same thing for the other four components that I need to cut out for the inlay. And I can do that fairly quickly by right-clicking on the toolpath I just created and selecting Duplicate. I can also just press Control D, which I'm going to do until I have five toolpaths. Now, I'll give each of these a more meaningful name in a moment, but I'm going to start editing them first. So I'm going to right-click on the next one, select Edit, and everything is the same except that on the Geometry tab, I want to clear the selected contour and select a different contour. Press OK. I'll keep doing that for the other ones. Now for each of these, I'll go in and, and rename them to a more meaningful name. So I click once to select and then click again. And I'll give these the same names as I named the bodies. Okay, there we go. So now we have four tool paths for cutting out all of the shell inlay material. Next, I'll create a tool path for machining the pocket in the background. And to do that, I'm going to go back up to my model here and I'll click the visibility icon to show the background. And then I'll go up to this container of bodies, which is where all of the other pieces reside, and I'll hide that. And I'm going to select under 2D a 2D pocket toolpath for machining this pocket in the background material. Just as I did with the previous toolpath, I need to select a tool. This time I'm going to select my wood cutting bit and press OK. Next I'll switch to the geometry tab and I'm going to select the pocket contour that I want to machine. And I'm going to click on the lower contour of this pocket to define my toolpath. So I'll switch to the Heights tab, and I'll adjust the heights as I did before. Change the retract height, the uh, clearance height, to one millimeter. St retract height to one millimeter. And I'm gonna make that relative to the feed height, which is the next selection. I'm gonna change the feed height to two millimeters. I'm gonna allow a little bit longer feed height because for this type of toolpath, it's going to do a little more uh, ramping down into the material, and I need just a little bit more room to do that. My top height, again, I'm going to set to one millimeter from the top of my model, just as before. And finally, the bottom height, I'll leave it the default at zero millimeters from the selected contours, which is going to machine down to the bottom of my pocket. Next, I'll switch to the Passes tab. The first thing I want to change is to enable finishing passes. What this is going to do is rough out the pocket first with a fairly uh, coarse cut, and then it's going to take a shallower cut at the very end to remove just a tiny bit more material, and that leaves me a, a smoother finish on the pocket. I'll set the step over here for the finishing passes to 0.2 millimeters. Next, I'll roll my mouse wheel to scroll down and enable multiple depths. This is because I don't want to cut the entire depth of the pocket all at once, because again, I would probably break my cutter. I'm going to set the maximum roughing step down to 0.5 millimeters. So it'll take off half a millimeter at a time. Then I'm going to check finish only at final depth. So it'll do all of the roughing step downs without doing that final finishing pass. And then the very last step down, it's going to step down 0.2 millimeters to remove the last two millimeters of the bottom of my pocket. And then and only then is it going to do that final finishing pass to remove 0.2 millimeters from the edge as well. That should give me a really good surface on the finished pocket. 
Lastly, on this tab, I want to uncheck this stock to leave checkbox. You can use that if you want to use a separate machining operation for the final finishing pass, but I can use this single tool path just setting it up with the finishing pass as I did. And one more setting I need to change on the linking tab. If I go down to the ramp setting, I need to change the ramp clearance height from 2.5 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters. Half a millimeter is more than plenty to start ramping into the material. Now I'll press OK to generate my toolpath. You can see all of the moves. I'm going to hold down Shift and click the center mouse button to roll around a little bit. And you can see the paths that my cutter is going to take. It's quite a lot of cutting. And if I were doing this in a manufacturing setting, I definitely would want to try to optimize this toolpath to maybe cut a little faster, use fewer passes, get the material out quicker. And one of the ways to do that is just to start increasing the speed and increasing the amount you take off each time until you break a tool and then go back and reduce it. I don't want to do that. I don't want to break a tool and I'm not in a hurry. So this will be perfectly fine for me. And I recommend you start out with settings similar to this. Be fairly conservative and avoid breaking tools. And then if you need to speed things up, you can, but do it gradually. And next I have one more step, which is to generate G-code to drive the CNC machine and cut out these parts. So I'll start with the upper left wing tool path. I'm going to right click and select post process. If you've never done this before, you might want to look up some of the documentation on post processing to figure out how to install a custom post processor, which is what I'm using. And this is the post processor for the DDCS panel and also for the CNC Shark controller. And I published that on my website, so you can go download that if you have a control panel similar to mine. Otherwise, if you're using one of the post processors that's built into Fusion 360, this drop-down list lets you select the one that corresponds to your machine. You need to select an output folder, and I'll choose an output folder such as uh, C temp. I'm going to leave this checkbox checked, uh, which is to open the numerical control file, the, the, the G code, in an editor, just so you can see what it generated. Now I'll press post to generate my G code. I'm going to call this ulwing.tap because that's the toolpath I'm using. Okay, now we've opened a text editor just to show you the G code. The exact output obviously varies with the post processor that you choose and the one that I wrote that you can get from my website at brainwright.com puts some comments in here that are kind of useful. One interesting one to look at is tool travel. This shows the entire range of X, Y, and Z motion of the tool. I'll switch back to Fusion 360 and I'm going to do the post processing for the remaining tool paths. <music> Okay, now I've generated the G-code files for each of the inlay elements and a G-code component for the pocket that I'll cut in the wood background to do the inlay. Well, that wraps up part one of this two-part video series. We've got our design done in Fusion 360. We generated tool paths in G-code to drive our CNC machine. And in the next video, part two, I'm going to set up my CNC machine. I'll set it up to cut the shell inlay material and the wooden pocket that it fits into. And I'll show you how to fine-tune it to get the fit just right and uh, build some great-looking inlay, so stay tuned.